Yeah, another dry physics video production. Oh, presentation. Yeah, sorry. Didn't produce much. Um, no, didn't work too hard at it. Comments video. It's not going to be any fun at all. So, anyway, needs to be done, I suppose. But, whatever. So, Danny. Donnie? Yeah, Donnie. Uh, uh, thank you for the view of CERN and what's going on, although they could explain what's what better. We should have like a comma. Um, without that, it could very well be a circle jerk lol just for funding. Well, all of this stuff is a little bit complex in the sense that it gets funded for reasons, you know, they don't really have anything to do with science. It has to do with what the military might be able to do with you know, some like super radioactive element or something, you know, they could just, you know, kill a bunch of soldiers or people or whatever. So a lot of it just has to do with um, the the fact that if you don't do the research, somebody else might have a, you know, death ray gap thing, you know, you don't want to have other people getting a death ray before you, blah, 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 blah. So, um, that's why a lot of this crap, like LIGO gets funded, it's because they think they're going to be able to you know, listening on the Kremlin, you know, with their interferometer thingy. Um, and, you know, <laughs> we'll never know, uh, because, uh, we don't have honest governments. <laughs> so, you know, the truth won't be something, uh, the public gets, um, information regarding. So I just thought I'd point out this whole CERN thing in particle physics, uh, the argument, so, so what they're looking for, so it's a ton of data, right? And the whole idea is that particles do what they think. This is something to do with the truth, that something is moving, and that something hits something else, and then it breaks into pieces, and they don't get to see, you know, what happens, where it goes, because, you know, their chamber doesn't produce images of everything, you know, so some of it's invisible, and their stuff flies off, and then hits some other thing, and then all of a sudden there's magically a little line of stuff going some direction and then there's some place in the future where oh no something came over here and then something else started moving in a direction and they got some photons off of that so they're just looking for patterns and the stuff they're saying exists like the Higgs boson would be some invisible part you know there's no evidence that it really exists there's just this evidence that something was hit here and it you know a certain amount of time later something else just kind of spontaneously uh you know did something else and so they're saying the thing that caused that spontaneous something else is this higgs boson or you know it, the their positron or some other made up <laughs> crap um what i would argue <laughs> is that they don't really understand decay as a concept you know that you know these big atoms <clears throat> you know the the radioactive ones um, that you know something like they have a little tiny window in them a little vulnerability you know like Superman and kryptonite there's like a little spot on the <laughs> you know on the atom where if something goes in just right okay it hits the little magic bit you know it's it's like uh, the Death Star you know and Luke you know and you shoot the, the, the you know shoot the little bullet into the Death Star's anus just right, and everything goes, and this whole thing blows up. And then the atom splits in half, you know, <laughs> it's whatever. And, um, you know, there's a bunch of leftover bits, <clears throat> and depending on how many leftover bits, you know, kind of tells you the radioactivity. Like, see, uranium is, you know, it doesn't decay. It's really hard to decay it in the sense that it's kind of hard to hit the, the magic little spot. Um, but when you do, you get a whole bunch of crap out. And like other elements, they decay really easy. You know, they have a half-life of 15 minutes. Um, so the atoms fall apart fairly easy. Uh, but the trick is, is when they fall apart, they don't make very much extra bits. You know, there's very little, one little bit of radiation comes out. It's not much. And so you don't get much out of them. Um, so what else needs? Oh, yeah, so... Um, I don't have a, don't have a proper eraser at the moment, but this will have to do. <laughs> Close enough. Uh, so, get a little white chalk, maybe. Um, all right, so <clears throat> what I would argue, a lot of these 
things they're calling particles are is what happens is is electrons that are there in atoms can get hit by a beam of energy you know which is this stuff coming at a frequency and um, it gets pushed by it and you know I've talked before about how physics doesn't really deal with this thing called ray you know uh, we'll call it length um, they don't really deal with that concept at all they just pretend there's no such thing as a difference in how much energy can be streaming in, in terms of how long the ray can be so if you have enough a long enough ray hitting something what's going to happen to the electron is it's going to keep making exchanges you know it's keep going to, it's going to keep trading this for this or that or some other direction and by making those exchanges this thing's going to go faster and faster and faster and it's essentially going to start catching up to the speed of the force that's hitting it and the simple thing that's happening really is the particles going very fast okay it uses up some of this ray to go very fast but once it's going very fast it's going almost the speed of this stuff and so this stuff is only interacting you know kind of slowly like once every millionth of a second or something and then the next one catches up and finally hits it and speeds it up a little bit more and keeps it going the speed of light but eventually this ray runs out and as it runs out the muon okay the well uh, there's probably some symbol for it you know <laughs> whatever <laughs> f u um <laughs> you know there's always some dopey sick symbol but anyway so this thing they're calling a particle is really just an electron because that's what it decays into realistically and uh all that happens is is it finally the ray that's pushing it goes finally goes through it because it's going very fast so the ray finally runs out then the particle is stuck with the drag issue in the sense that it's hitting more stuff coming against it than going with it and it just slowly runs out of gas and twirls into nothing because it stops moving it's, uh, it becomes quite invisible because it's not energizing it's not interacting anymore and that's it that's its decay its decay is it just runs out of fuel and the fuel was this bombardment of a photon uh you know with obviously um <clears throat> i would argue very narrow polarization that is a very very high frequency um very narrow polarization and that's what pushed it and that's <clears throat> what maintained its velocity and it finally ran out of velocity <clears throat> and then it dragged to a halt and that's all the muon is it's not some new particle it's just the same old crap okay just in a different circumstance just as the uh, neutron is just the electron and the proton in a configuration where you could argue they're just very close together and <clears throat> the electron might even be actually spinning um, around the neutron but I don't think it's necessary but it might be the part of the truth and that's why it looks neutral is because yeah it is neutral it has plus and minus and they're close enough together that it's a dipole from almost any distance it looks like nothing uh, charge wise and, and that's the, the facts all right uh, that's the better story uh, all these particles are not really particles they're just the same old particles the same old electrons and protons moving being pushed by different methods and therefore um, behaving a little different but that's it there's still only two charged things electrons and protons there's no antiparticles there's there's none of that stuff it's real this part of the story they made up um, <clears throat> that only vaguely fits the evidence all right, I've just found that if you drop batteries from the same height, five or six inches, well, why not 10 or 12 inches, or why not 20 feet, uh, that the battery with less energy, you mean the full battery versus the expired battery, fine, uh, bounces higher. Wow. So he made some face there. Can you please tell why that happens and, and fell free? To test this yourself why would I care I mean you know this is basic chemistry I mean batteries are 
chemical uh, mechanisms and you're changing the chemistry of the battery okay when it's emptying it's creating um, it's going back into one substance from another substance so it's changing it because it's changing its composition so it's like saying um, I don't know you mix vinegar and baking soda and you get this explosive reaction well what you have after the reaction is different than what you had before the reaction you could argue chemically and that you have to go through a process to get back what you had before you have something chemically different the atoms are different so of course it would bounce differently because it's chemically different <laughs> It's like making it out of, I don't know, uh, chalk, and then it turns into plastic. You know, that kind of thing. I mean, why would you think a chalk battery would bounce exactly the same as a, 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 a plastic battery? You know, they're chemically different. Duh. End of that. I, the conversation is completely uninteresting, in my opinion. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, anyway. Uh, F.O. Sisu, whatever. Uh, just to mention another possible way to test the scenario of the wire between the two north ends would be to use one of those cathode rayed in gas since it acts the same way as the wire. So I think, thought we went over some of this already. Oh dear, this is wow, just way too much typing. Although that would make it more difficult to precisely measure the force, but more visually prominent. Uh, anyway, in the conventional theory, if you apply the lens force using the right hand rule, the two north ends would create forces in opposite directions. See, that sort of says Yui, but yes, I would agree that would be the implication. Um, one straight up and one straight down, just because clockwise from one side is counterclockwise to the other side, right? Right. Um, and would cancel each other out. Well, no, it'd probably cause the wire to rotate, maybe. Um, assuming the magnets are of equal strength. Uh, so, since the Lorenz magnetic force does at least work in modeling the effects of the magnet on the current carrying wire, I'd imagine they'd just cancel each other out in real life. Yeah, I don't know about the canceling out part. <clears throat> um, uh, yeah, I'll add something. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I gotta find a proper board cleaner, so I'll go do that and be back. Uh, yeah. yeah, all right, back. Um, all right, so uh, Lorraine's force. I don't. You know, they should come up with a better name for it. The motor force, I think, is the, you know, sorry to offend the Lorenz, but frankly, it should be called something relevant to what it accomplishes. So the idea is you have a magnet north end and your south end, and you put electricity through a wire stuck inside of there, and if you go one direction, you know, the electricity is going into the board, you know, the, the wire moves up, the electricity is coming out of the board, the wire moves down. I'm arguing that this is basically a paramagnetic, paramagnetic effect in the sense that the surfaces of the conductor change based on the paramagnetism. That is, one side of the wire becomes south and the other side becomes north. And as the electricity goes through, it does this right hand rule that basically is saying, you know, if you hit me one way, you know, these will be opposing forces. That is, this will be repulsion and repulsion on both sides because of the paramagnetic effect on the surfaces. Um, and uh, in one case, right hand, that is, you always turn you know, to the left or to the right. Let's just say it's to the right. So right would be down, okay, if you were to push it into a third dimension. I mean, it's it's not going to do right and left like that. It's going to do right and left by turning right in the third dimension. So right from the perspective of the thing in the third dimension, right is down in one case, and right on the other case, because it's an opposite effect, would be um, also down because it's the inverse circumstance. Yeah. So although they're opposite, they're double opposites 
Okay, it's it's the the opposite force um, causing the effect, and then it's the opposite in terms of the clockwise is the opposite direction, right? This wing thinks clockwise is that way. This side sees clockwise going that way. And um, but that's the effect. Okay, so that's reasonably understandable, I would argue, as understanding it as the, the material changes, it becomes itself magnetic, so it is a repulsive force on both sides, and it just matters on which way it's going to push it into the third dimension. Um, right, so I asked the question, what if I make this a north, you know, and I hit both sides with north side, well then obviously one side will be pushing down, and <coughs> one side not both so one side will be pushing down say this side wants to go this way and this side will want to go this way and you'll end up with the turning force which sort of duplicates Faraday's experiment in the sense that he kind of isolated the magnetic poles in the sense that he only like when he used a wire and had the wire spin around the magnet he was using only one pole of the magnet and so that sort of makes sense that the wire would rotate. All right, so um, I think there's experiments demonstrating that, so I, it's just such a, it's like the simplest version of the motor force. All right, now the second part of his statement is, also what about cyclotron? There's a video showing the working principle of a cyclotron, yeah, there's lots of videos but they really don't show the working principle. It mentions a vacuum chamber, so in case there is, in, in this case, there's no gas, but the charged beam is still experiencing the Lorenz magnetic force um, perpendicular to its plane of motion in the plane of the magnetic field, although this is just an animation. Right, and that's part of the problem is, is they, they, the shortcuts they keep doing. So when they explain this, <coughs> they talk about charged particles they're they're not charged particles okay so all right so the basic idea of the cyclotron is the weird thing is you know i saw one done where they didn't even do it in the traditional way so what you have is like a hollow chamber okay it's a hollow in there you know you can go inside this metal thing and they call these the d's um so you have these little hollow things and the idea is, is you introduce something charged in here, and you have a magnet, you know, south end coming from the top, north end coming from the bottom. Um, and what you're going to cause the charge to do, as they say it, is it's going to keep changing its direction. So if it goes, you know, this way, um, it's going to be bombarded by the bunch of magnetic field. And the magnetic field is going to cause that right turn, and then it's going to go. And then when it's going straight, it's going to cause it to right turn again. And it goes in here, and it goes in here, and it goes in here, and it goes in. Here. Now you can draw it as a square. I'm just saying. Obviously, what happens is it's doing it every millisecond. So the pattern looks like uh, a circle getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. All right. All right. Now what they don't tell you is. They're not electrons and protons. They talk as if they are electrons. So it's just like the Stern-Gerlach experiment where they say, we're looking at electrons, when no, they're looking at silver atoms. Uh, you know, and so this is just such a cheat because they're saying it's the moving charge. Well, it's not a moving charge. It's a moving ion. So an ion means that it has an electron and a proton, and it's in an unstable state in the sense that the proton and the electron are far enough away from each other that from this angle it looks very positive, from this angle it looks very negative. Um, it's an ion, all right? So yeah, the magnetic field is basically pulling. It's saying to the proton, go this way. And it's saying to the electron, go this way. And so it doesn't go either way, okay? <laughs> because it's being pulled both ways. And so all you're doing is stretching ions and you're hitting them with, um, you know, the energy. Obviously, the proton end is going to head for the north end magnet, and the electron is going to head for the south end magnet. All right. So you can understand they're going to be hit by opposite force. So that is, 
the north end is going to be radiating if this was you know if we did this properly you know with color um, you know one end is going to be getting hit by the blue force let's say and one end is getting hit by the red force you know the north end I think that's up here I drew it all right well regardless and these are opposite forces right this is the pink object you know and this is the blue object all right <clears throat> so that inverse thing is happening and that's when it goes into the third dimension so it's getting hit by a force that causes the three-dimensional um, so again the two interactions you can have are two things hit each other one goes this way one goes this way you can also have the interaction where two things collide with each other still on the board there yeah and you have this reaction where it goes up this way and it goes down this way and that both of them make sense in terms of equilibrium um, you know conservation of momentum at minimum but not conservation of direction and that's what we have in the case of the motor force is a non-conservation of momentum momentum is one one direction and you end up with a third dimension you end up with a direct a new direction and so my argument has been is that the that's exactly the interaction you get when you hit red things with blue force or blue things with red force is you get this uh, opposite to the actual momentum reaction so you lose something going this way that's the it's a head-on collision but the head-on collision produces movement in the thing this way and release of force this way um, but it's in the third dimension so I'm doing it in these two dimensions but that's essentially the right hand rule is just taking this and moving it in and out so you can kind of understand that there's no real loss of reality in switching dimensions you know it's like thinking of the corners of a cardboard box and thinking that you can be going this way and there's absolutely no difference from you going this way towards this you know around the corner of the box or down the side of the box the, there wouldn't be anything that tells you oh this is much easier and this is much harder even though it you think about it it looks harder <laughs> but it isn't any harder all right <clears throat> so that's probably enough of that yeah um, well, anyway, yeah, so what I did see was, <laughs> yeah, so at Harvard, they apparently have one of these little, little cyclotron, and it only has one box, you know, and the other, so the whole thing is in a vacuum, so again, I, I want to, you know, point out, okay, so they put the boxes inside a vacuum, um, so the point is, is that you're not seeing electrons in a vacuum, okay, the cyclotron isn't moving charges, it's moving ions, it's moving atoms okay that's what's spinning around in the cyclotron and they don't strip the electrons off till the very end so when they get the ions moving really fast then they put it through a filter that knocks the protons off or knocks the electrons off so they can see either protons or just electrons but it's not till after the process of acceleration do they strip the electrons off or the protons off and create individual charges so it's just it's just such gross information when they say these are moving charges they're moving ions <laughs> an ion is completely different than an individual positive charge or an individual negative charge fundamentally different things right. <clears throat> so I think I've made the point ah we have more <clears throat> I did find a video of an electron beam cathode ray being deflected by a magnetic field, but this time in a vacuum tube using a fluorescent phosphorus coated screen down the middle of the tube instead of a gas. <clears throat> yes, like you were mentioning, right. <clears throat> you won't see that one go up and down. You'll see it go towards and away. Um, but anyway, this time the beam was deflected straight away and towards the magnet. There you go. Uh, like you said, <laughs> yes, exactly. It should, in a vacuum, depending on whether the magnet is north and south face towards the tube, the beam is not experiencing the Lorentz force like it did <clears throat> in the gas-filled tube. So a gas 
<clears throat> so again, when it's gas filled, you're only seeing, okay, the electrons that have hit an atom. That's how you're seeing the invisible particles is by them hitting atoms and creating photons you can see. So now you're only seeing the things that are actually moving up and down. You're not seeing the things that are just moving straight. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thanks for mentioning that experiment existed as they usually show the cathode rate in a gas and completely ignore whichever effect the gas might have on the claim that the lens force is only due to the electron moving. Here's the video. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's another video showing <clears throat> this particular tube up close and in more detail, known as a Crookes tube. Yeah, well, I've, I've seen, uh, you know, a few videos, so, um, yeah, I'll go look at those. I just won't do it right now. Um, I think we both are in agreement that they kind of describe, misdescribe the evidence, and they talk about when they're, you know, when they're not moving, you know, they call both an ion moving, a dipole moving, and a charge moving the same thing. And now they've done it to electrons, where, you know, they've actually turned electrons into dipoles, pretending that electrons somehow have a magnetic moment of their own, where they're somehow, there's some moment when they're positive and not negative, which is just had there's just no evidence that electrons are anything ever except negative anyway since my semester has just started this week i'm going to show this to some of my physics professors and see what they say it's definitely pretty mind-blowing to me considering i've only seen the experiment with the gas and the physicists normally say moving electrons should experience lorentz force in a magnetic field well, again, and why? Why is what is the magnetic field? I mean, how can anybody deny that the only possibility for an electron is to move in that magnetic field towards the magnet or away from the magnet? I mean, it can only be repelled by the north side and attracted by the the, the, the south side. There's no there's no option for a single electron or for a single proton, and obviously the only thing they can make it complicated is the fact that if it's yeah if it's got a, an electron on one end and a proton on the other end it's a little magnet it's going to have a hard time deciding which way it's supposed to go it's obviously going to be in conflict and it's not going to be motivated to move towards the north end or towards the south end because both have this implication of being anti the interest of the other party the two parties are husband and wife or whatever and one the husband wants to go to you know hookerville and the wife wants to go to Pretty Flower, uh, you know, fantasy land. And, you know, they're in one car. It just ain't going to happen. All right. <clears throat> Unless I'm missing some major detail in the conventional theory between the experiment of the cathode rate in a vacuum versus the gas that would account for the difference. Yes, the entire difference is entirely the the environment and again you can go back to the stern gerlach experiment where they're drawing all these kind of conclusions about magnetic moments of electrons when there's no electron in the experiment except one's tied to protons except one's bound in atoms i mean it's a, a terrible cheat to talk about what moving charges are doing when you're not moving a charge Okay, obviously, like you're saying, it seems the gas, or lack thereof, is the culprit. I'm not sure if the phosphorus and the fluorescent material has any effect. Well, it only has an effect in the sense it's pretty much terminating the existence of the electron. So it's the same effect as blowing smoke on a laser beam. Okay, I mean, it'll make some of the photons visible, but obviously those photons aren't going anywhere else. So all you're doing by crashing the beam, the electrons, into the fluorescent material, you're basically terminating the ones you're going to see. You're just making electrons visible by having them crash into something and create photons. All right. So, yeah, this is good. I mean, you get my point. You investigated. You found out I was right. Excellent. <laughs> okay, excellent. Uh, good news. But like I said, I was really surprised about the cyclotron that, you know, they keep talking about the fact that, they're, that, that the charge does this spiral to death thing. The charge doesn't do that. The dipole does that. All right. 
uncontrollable diarrhea. So one of the classier folk, probably the cowboy, who apparently is a religious kook. So that's, you know, it's interesting. I named this channel after what your channel is the verbal equivalent of, isn't that clever? So yeah, that's the best you can do. So you think you're defending conventional physics with these profoundly uh, immature, <laughs> uh, nonsensical rubbish comments. Oh, great job. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure in the future, you know, when this is looked back upon, there will be many people cringing. <laughs> okay, people you would hope to be on your side will be cringing. Oh, he didn't do that. In our name? Oh. Like your God. Do you think your God is really happy with you? <laughs> Jesus, what a stupid fuck. Uh, I think I just realized why he makes so many videos uncontrollably. So, so again, you don't have any counter-argument for the physics arguments being made, ever. This is all you can do. This is the best you can do in defense of your religion. Your little wooey verses. Pathetic. All right, uncontrollable, clever, it is not. Immature and petty, it is. Yes, well, you're pointing out the obvious, but fine. Thank you for pointing out the obvious. I don't know. Okay. It's not much of an effort to deter their behavior, I suppose. Uh, but anyway, enough of that. Uh... Yeah, see, I'm censoring them. You know, they have so many great arguments. Pathetic. All right, so Raymond Gelfield. Says Ray, real name, no, but whatever. Uh, Gefland, sorry. Gef, Gelfend. Stupid fucking name. Anyway, I see no argument being made by you, just assertions that the other side is a religious doctrine. So again, every video is full of specific arguments about specific functions. It's just too silly an argument. Um, you are ex exactly like a creationist, except a creationist doesn't show you a bunch of bones and uh, you know uh, DNA molecule, and they have absolutely zero evidence for their nonsense, uh, especially real evidence, in the sense that they just show you fake evidence. Like your physics, for example, the fake detector experiments, the fake stern Gerlach we moved electrons with a magnetic field, why? The fake LIGO crapola, where we can see the distance between, you know, half the distance of a proton, we can measure that. I mean, you're the ones with the preposterous exaggerations of your magical powers and what the, the magical things you've created, your your, your neutrinos and your positrons and your antiparticles and your annihilations and your creations. I mean, it's a frickin' religion. Obviously. <clears throat> anyway, watch some of the convicted felon Kurt Kovan. So, so, so he's bringing up religious people as making some sort of argument. So he hasn't pointed out how I'm wrong about anything. He hasn't quoted my wrong statements. I mean, certainly you could quote religious people and say, well, that's crap. <laughs> you don't have any evidence for that. Where are you doing that? Where are you pointing out how my evidence is flawed and your evidence is correct? Oh, that's right. You're not doing that. You're running like a little pussy from that obligation. All right, another useless comment by the same useless turd. <clears throat> How can the space tell you matter? How can the space tell the matter how much it's bent? I don't know. Why are you asking me? I'm not the one who believes in bent space. Uh, where does the extra space go? Uh, why are you asking these questions? Uh, the questions are exactly as loaded and exactly as straw many as how can a rock evolve into a chinchilla. So there's like good evidence where you can show how chemistry evolves into a chinchilla. <laughs> you know, there, there, there is a, a pretty good model of how that process actually takes place through the process of making a DNA molecule that um, creates 
individual chemical compounds and then uses those compounds to build instrumentality that give you chinchilla features. Um, <clears throat> how many times have you seen the turtle evolve into an orangutan? Well, what we have seen in the sense of the, what the fossil record indicates is that hippopotamuses and elephants uh, turned into whales and porpoises. Um, <clears throat> so you're a creationist. You think Gary Mosier. So you've got, what, you've got to put my name in the, in, the, in the comment for some reason. So you, that's what he does on the Internet. He goes out and uh, docks people. For what reason? Um, create the universe. I mean, you're just a despicable human being. I don't know why YouTube keeps allowing you to create these sock accounts to keep doing the same exact shit over and over and over again. Uh, they, they'll censor my videos, take down videos that have been up for eight years because of some fake violation, but they'll let horse shit like this just continue to do this harassment, this useless nonsense. All right. Uh, Child-free, hum-humpin-free vegan, whatever that means. Uh, a recent article in Blah Blah titled, Why the Foundations of Physics Have Not Progressed in f for 40 Years. Okay, so this, yeah, this is, obviously this is, uh, what's her name? I mean, I have her subscribed. Uh, she just made a video. What the hell is it? Oh, strange. Just made a video. Oh, there it is. <laughs> she changed the icon. Okay, how to test quantum gravity. Um, Sabine Haasen uh, Fielder. Um, and the irony of the argument is that she doesn't like what happened in the last 40 years. And the physics that really needs to do over is the physics from 80 or 90 or 100 years ago. That's where they really got to go back and say, boy, did we ever take some wrong turns. Um, and she's perfectly comfortable with all that wooey crap. The whole wave particle duality nonsense. I mean, that's the one they should have said right from the start. Oh, screw that. That's too silly. And clearly the bent space argument is just mush. Just has abs it adds absolutely zero value to anything called understanding a process. The nothing tells the something what to do. Again, as <laughs> he says that that's, that's like asking a cre creationist to uh, show evidence of a miracle on Earth, like where somebody's arm grew back or something. Um, no, that's a perfectly valid thing to do. Um, how exactly does nothing make something move? Oh, it's not nothing. It's a whole infrastructure of ether. So why don't you just admit that? Why don't you just admit, well, it's got to be a whole infrastructure, a whole complex system that we're just saying doesn't exist, but it does exist. We don't give it any name. We just call it bench space time. Doesn't mean anything. It's useless non-informative so i did um delete some comments and uh, just because they're just too stupid but i'll read some of them but they're just too stupid mostly posted by some guy with an s name you know no no screen name um but it's just this you know he's just regurgitating a bunch of ken wheeler crap and uh, you know just assertions with no evidence uh so he says the so-called electrons are not particles so where's your evidence that they're not? Are you going to produce any citation to a single experiment demonstrating how electrons aren't real things? Uh, not objects or subjects. Whatever that mushy metaphysical bullshit is. Nobody's worried about whether they're objects or subjects in a conversation. <laughs> they're not really worried whether they're the first person or third person. They're, that's not the subject. The subject is, is there a thing? Uh, called an electron. Um, <clears throat> but are the dynamic principle of discharge, which, boy, doesn't that say absolutely nothing. The dynamic principle of discharge. Do, 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 do. No, mush. Uh, and are <clears throat> certainly not charge carriers. They're not, they don't, they're not charge carriers in the sense they're not the force carriers. There's, there's no word charge carrier. Okay, there's force carrier, the virtual photon is a force carrier. The charge thing 
is what's emanating force carriers. So you, you don't even have the rhetoric right. So the electron is claimed to be charged. It's not a carrier. It's a possessor of this quality called charge, which I would argue is merely the fact that there's two kinds of force and if you're charged you react to one force one way and you react to the other force another way. All right. <clears throat> but you prove nothing. You're just this fucking you assholes who think you can just make assertions and you cite no evidence. All right. Tesla himself, wow. Uh <laughs> you know, all by himself. Anyway, did not believe in the electron particle nor the photon. Well, I as I pointed out, I think Tesla was had no clue. Okay, <laughs> his his physics was garbage, and he wasted millions of dollars proving his physics was garbage. Um, a conductor is a reflector. Says you. <laughs> how how so? I thought it was a coaxial cable. Well, anyway, uh, the notion of electricity or electron beam beads flowing through wires is a myth. More claims. Where you where did you prove that? Now I would argue that they're not, you know, and even regular physics kind of knows electrons really aren't going. You know, like a whole zillion of them are flying through the wire at light speed or something. That clearly the but the electrons are moving, but they're moving in a sense of just changing position. Uh, the wires act like gu gu guides. Let's say nothing. A superconductor will have almost zero magnetic permeability. There's no such thing as a permeability retard. Okay. Uh, I go. <laughs> Can't, well, maybe he said LIGO, but it came out I go. Billion dollar frauds. And you proved it with what evidence again? You, what's your argument? Oh, you're not making one. And we're paying for it. No government is smart enough to argue with physicists. Well, they, they're not going to argue with the fact that there's potential military uses for these expensive devices, so that's why they get funded. Uh, so I guess it makes them right. No, it just means that as a practical matter, um, the the people running governments usually aren't physicists. So, and the physicists believe all this mush anyway. So, you know, what smart people are you going to get to scrutinize it and say it has very little potential? See, at least in the Tesla case, the government could figure out the guy's batshit stupid because he had no theory. I mean. We didn't buy his ray gun because they figured out he doesn't have any idea how to make one. <laughs> okay, he just doesn't. He couldn't persuade them that he had any new thing to add except, look, I blew a bunch of holes in Colorado. I mean, I burned these big, huge holes in the ground. Isn't that proof I know how to make a ray gun? No. Proved he knows how to waste electricity. All right. The photoelectric effect is actually an electrostatic buildup at the inner atomic level. So again, a non -ex a non informative statement. Yes, everybody knows it has something to do with atoms. <laughs> yeah, everybody knows that. <sighs> Einstein never discovered the photoelectric effect. No, he explained it. Um, Hertz and had already observed it. Um, yeah, the the but the fact is is that they observed it without understanding it and Einstein explained it at least in some more co consistent terms. Um however, Einstein was the one who won the Nobel Prize for his bullshit explanation of it. Well, that's frankly it's not exactly bullshit. I mean, it's bullshit to not recognize again as stated that the only way we can measure energy is in clumps. So, of course, it's going to look clumpy when all you can see is clumps. Okay. <clears throat> it was discovered that in UV light, there's a threshold frequency that releases electrostatic charge between a cathode and an anode in a vacuum tube. So, you don't even understand what a vacuum tube is doing. It's just making the surface really hot. It's making something really hot. And what happens when it's really hot? It starts falling apart. 
and so you're shooting bits off of it because you're making it so freaking hot that it's falling apart and pieces are flying off. All right, the shorter wavelength of light that <clears throat> penetrates the copper plates overcomes its natural dielectric permutivity. So more mushy bullshit talk. Um, no, you won't draw any of this, that's for sure. The threshold... <clears throat> Uh, frequency at which electrostatic charge is generated and released says you um, frequency has an effect on things caught in tension the simple argument is, is that electrons are tied to protons and to break that tie you have to hit them with a certain amount of energy in a certain amount of time or they relax back to their regular positions so it's really just a tipping point argument it's really just understanding that to move something um, that's elastic, inelastic, it will, it can uh, neutralize what you've done to it quickly. And if you don't move quicker than that, not much is going to happen. Uh, all right. Uh, the smaller the volume, I mean, if we were pumping air into an air rifle and your air rifle leaked a little bit, you could understand that you'd have to pump really, really fast to actually build up more pressure because you'd be leaking more than you're pumping. I mean, there's lots of analogies. Shit for brain. I.e. UV compared to red light. The higher the capacitance, it says this is Ken Wheeler nonsense. <laughs> capacitance. Capacitance has something to do with more the smaller the space, the higher the capacitance. It's just retarded. No, the smaller the space, likely the, the higher the pressure retard. Okay, high energy discharges have very small coaxial volume, so that's more Ken Wheeler shit. Um, um, coaxial volume and frequency. So just more gibberish words. It's just no, there's no way to draw what you're talking about where I can draw something that's reasonable in terms of somebody understanding what pressure is and why pressure has, uh, is associated with higher energy is the simple argument that if, uh, you know, if you do have something bouncing between two surfaces in a frictionless environment, right? So it's always going the same speed and I move the two surfaces closer together, higher capacitance, Smaller the space, higher the capacitance. No, higher the interaction rate. So now there's twice as many interactions happening here. Twice as many. So per minute of time, you could say, well, there's 20 hits here, you know, every minute. And there would be 40 hits here every minute. And all you did was move the two things closer together. You know, not, not a very complex action. Causes 40, you know, twice as much energy to exist here in the sense of twice as many interactions. And then obviously this would be a higher frequency if you let it loose. You know, if you removed one of these walls, just poof, it's gone. Um, this is going to leave at a higher frequency rate than this because the distance is traveling. You've taken all of this distance out. This distance never happens. And all you have is this distance before you get to a reflection. So, if I was to just remove this wall, this side is going to create a high frequency. This side, because there's still got to travel all of this distance, all this extra distance before there's a reflection, this side is going to create a much, a much longer frequency wavelength. That's the, the, the right, reasonable, sensible explanation. You're dielectric permutivity crap is just crap as an explanation <laughs> says nothing a rational brain can do anything with you haven't explained it where I have stupid f fuck alright uh, the medium the ether fuck you and your ether uh, the pulse perturbations I mean, this is more baby talk um, compressions and refractions more oh he can't say contraction and expansion right he has to say rare fractions I mean just such more 
only a assholes trying to confuse or hide that they don't know what they're talking about start using vocabulary that doesn't have any common uh, use or function. In the medium, the ether are what is mistaken for light particles, photons, says you with zero evidence. Again, not a citation to a single experiment demonstrating why you're right. Nothing. Each one of those pulse perturbations is encapsulated by transverse electrical and magnetic pulses prove the existence of any of those things what experiment proves their existence uh, coincident on either <coughs> the capacitance or the frequency so what what does that even mean the capacitance or the frequency how does something have those two things how does a something you know in in the world uh, have those two features at the same time doesn't make any sense. Things have momentum retard, and momentum is movement, not capacitance. Of the pulse perturbation of the Z axis longitudinal dielectric. More absolute, just bullshit words crammed together doesn't mean a damn thing. Longitudinal dielectric. What the fuck's a longitudinal dielectric? Show me one. Draw one. You lunatic. And from that sense, if you were able to take out the one bump of the field perturbation, you would see a transverse electrical magnetic sphere. Says you. No evidence. So to speak. So to speak. Not really a sphere. It's a roundioid. You know. Within one frequency oscillation of the X spectrum. Well, there's no point in reading this crap. It's just crap. All right. So meta character, a different idiot. Uh, person. Hello, what do you think caused the first movement? Who fucking cares? Uh, <laughs> why, why? You think it's going to matter? So if I said a little brown uh, rabbit turd did, or if I say, no, it was a big pile of zebra poo, what's the difference? What do you think the answer is going to be? Do you really think the answer is going to be at all like, holy shit, that's amazing? No, it's going to be some crude force thing, some mechanism, some some square thing. It's going to be something really simple, and you're going to say, oh, it's a square. Okay, I get it. It goes this way, and then it goes that way, and then it goes, okay, I get it. It's, it's, you know, is, it is it a necessary initial state is there a necessary initial state and and where where do you think there's anybody could possibly glean evidence of this theorem of the initial state of the universe you 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 know i mean conventional physics think it can create something called a singularity that is a, a you know a substance that has no dimensional space it takes up no dimensional space and has infinite mass that's their crazy starting point them embarrassing themselves by even mentioning what kind of silly stories they can make up, that's their problem. I mean, I'm not that big a fool. I don't pretend to know how the universe was created. Are all of its properties necessary? What does necessary even mean? The universe doesn't have any brain, okay? It's not a really smart thing that does really smart things. It's a really crude, simple thing that does really simple thing. That's the whole point. I'm pointing out to you, the physics is 2 plus 2 plus 2. I mean, it's, you know, you can't get any simpler than just having 1. And obviously, you know, a 1 can't do anything, <laughs> you know. So it's like as simple as doing something can get is to say there's two things and, you know, which would make everything, including my comment, inevitable. Everything is inevitable because the thing the universe is based on, it has real movement and momentum. It's a real thing, not a imaginary thing, not a wooey thing, not a random thing, not a spontaneous thing. It's a mechanical thing. Um, or did something come out of nothing, pure potentiality chaos? The answer is going to be simple, okay? I mean, yeah, it's a simple machine, okay? It has to do something. You build a machine, and you press the on button, 
it's going to do something based on how the machine is built. Well, yes, the truth is the fundamental universe, I could argue it's a machine that makes nothing. Okay, it's just conveyor belts throwing out tons of nothing. Nothing, 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 nothing. And the truth could be the machine broke. Okay, <laughs> something burned out. And whoops, and so all of a sudden it made something. Oh shit, we made something. But that's what's going to the answer is going to be something like that. Okay, that the something is just error in the perfect nothing. And all we've found out is oh shit, there's no perfect machine. The machine is imperfect, and every now and then it barfs out a something. But it's going to be an answer like that. <sighs> I would also be interested to hear your thoughts on the following quotations from Slavo Zizek. Um, I didn't know he, <laughs> he delved into physics, but yeah, it's just all bullshit, okay? Um, this idea of the pure real and the half real and, you know, some sort of em emergent something other of this, you know, you know, the sight of the disclosure of being. You know, who trying to talk about reality says some sort of horse shit like that? The sight of the disclosure of being. I mean, this is just baby mushy bullshit. This disdaining, which for all well-known reasons, Heidegger refuses to call subject. So again, just more <laughs> nonsense. You know, this is just wooey-verse bullshit. You know, that something's ambiguous in reality. The only thing that creates ambiguity is our lack of understanding, okay? And part of the lack of understanding happens when people do things that are really stupid and nobody fixes it, like calling uh, photons waves or something. Um, clearly getting plus and minus wrong, and they never fix it. And then they say something like, uh, you know, moving charges, blah, 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 and they're really talking about moving ions. <clears throat> Okay, um, void against the background of which entities uh, appear so-called again the operator of the transformation of uh, protological void into the void of ontological nothingness. I mean, what? To, how would you think I would have anything to say but, oh, fuck this nonsense. Um, constituted reality is never fully realized, actualized. <laughs> It needs to be, uh, what is this, I don't know, proximal objects and objects, I don't know, object, jet, A, which is the subject's counterpart in the world of objects, so this is more like anti-particle bullshit. Uh, math, is, so this is the other asshole, math is a, um, well, just to finish up on this, this metaphysical horse shit. Uh, my whole point, okay, <laughs> certainly, I'm saying their physics is wrong. Certainly their metaphysics is nonsense. Um, and, yeah, it's not that complicated. We're just machines. Uh, consciousness is just a byproduct of a complex um, mechanism. It's an illusion created inside your brain. Your brain is making it right now. It's manufacturing awareness. Okay, <laughs> you know, and it's seems to us like it's immaterial but no it's a material process electricity does it it creates this freaking uh, cartesian theater it creates a screen and a projector and an asshole watching i'm watching the world but i'm not really watching the world right i'm just watching what the projectionist has shown on my screen right i don't get to see all these details and I can some some of them I can only see in models. I can't see them in reality. I can only model their function, and that's the only way they can be seen. Doesn't mean the real things don't exist because all I have is a model of their function, and this brain is just creating a model of uh, perception, you know. But every piece of the theater is just synthetic in a matrix. I mean, we're sort of in a matrix. It's just that it's not a matrix connected to every, you know, our brains aren't connected. We're not in a connected matrix. We're not in a, we're, we're all stuck in a reality. But our brain is creating a matrix for 
this thing called consciousness to exist in. Now, anyway, metaphysics is just a waste of time, frankly. It's not what this channel has any intention to do. All right, math is a human contrivance. This is some more bullshit, right? I mean, math has discovered the relationships between the fact that four things, okay, is made of two things and two things. <laughs> you know, that if you put two things on this side, it'll weigh as much as four things over here. You know, two twos. Uh, something to help humans, no, uh, a formalization of what we already know. Well, that's uh, my, that's quoting me, frankly. Um, but it doesn't mean it's nothing, nothing more. Well, again, that's something, okay? It's not a contrivance. It's, it's recognizing some obvious generalities. You want to call it, it's like profiling reality, okay? It's a simple description of the reality. It doesn't recognize every nuance. Okay, something to help humans come to terms with reality. Again, it's not helping them come to terms with it. It's giving them tools to manipulate it because now they can uh, recognize that, um, oh, I can create a kind of pulley system and I can make something very heavy that I couldn't lift at all. I can make it easier to lift or possible to lift because I can lift it little tiny tiny bits at a time okay um, the universe is not about math the universe is uh, about the variables that math attempts to properly uh, organize so math attempts to organize the variables that are reality uh, and I would just argue that mm, a lot of math is nonsense they 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 give variables to things that they don't have, like when they said momentum is frequency. Big mistake. Fake variable. Wrong variable. Uh, things have momentum. They, frequency is not momentum. Uh, math is just a mental construct, so more nonsense. Well, anyway, there's no point in reading. They're just making assertions. No logic behind them. Let's see. When you're looking at particles, you likely find particles, especially when they are... <laughs> generously funded to do so they have a theory okay their standard model and it, it does predict certain things in the sense that um, you know you open the valve more and more water comes out <laughs> you know so yeah they have a certain expectation that at each at certain levels of, of energy they're, they're going to get a consequential effect um, but some of that is really abstract and they're yes all they're doing is saying if you look at a, a billion different pictures, you know, drawn by monkeys, um, one of the pictures is going to look like somebody. And that's not miraculous. Uh, how much more will physicists break down matter? Well, they really haven't broken it down well at all. I'd say their whole theory is crap. Okay, <laughs> it's just all nonsense. Um, when will it end? Uh, when will it end? Uh, I guess when they finally figure out that it is a waste of money. Or will it only end when funding ends? Yes, that's when that's what has to happen. Quantum mechanics doesn't prove anything. So that's just too vague a statement to pay any attention to. Um, what a quantum mechanics even is isn't properly defined. But clearly elements of it are perfectly valid and other elements of it are perfectly nonsensical. Um, spontaneous, for example. Random, for example. Uh, it provides the math for experimental replication. So again, it's really not, uh, you don't replicate experiments by doing math. You replicate experiments by actually doing the experiment. And again, the experiment doesn't necessarily tell you what the real variables are. You can do an experiment and not realize, well, temperature, the whole thing is temperature sensitive, and you're just not realizing that temperature is really important. So you get these variable results, and you think, oh, yeah, I'm on to something. And then you find out, oh, I forgot one of the variables, temperature matters. Uh, but whatever, enough of this horse shit, I think. Um... Uh, let's see. When you're looking for particles, you're likely to find particles. You already did that, so enough of enough. Look, asshole, making assertions on any video is just bullshit. 
you have to make arguments and arguments have to contain some kind of reasoning or citation to some sort of evidence that's all we have is reasoning and evidence if you go into a courtroom you can't just make assertions you can't just walk in and say he's guilty I know he's guilty he's very very guilty he's guilty 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 he's so freaking guilty I know he's guilty he's guilty he looks guilty to me it's guilty he's you know you can't do that you have to actually prove it you have to demonstrate it and you demonstrate it with some continuity in explaining it how it evolved or something you make some sort of argument about how the evidence indicates but these assertions that something's you know perpetuating uh, in a coaxial field of <coughs> whatever uh, <laughs> you know uh, permutivitized ether is saying nothing enough of a video Phew. So, till next time, it's so much. Okay.